Have you ever finished reading a page, reached the end, and realized you have absolutely no idea what you just read? Your eyes moved across the words. You saw them. But somehow, nothing stayed. It's as if the information just passed through your mind like water through a sieve. This is one of the most frustrating experiences in learning. We read something important, something we need to know, and a day later it's gone. A week later, we might as well have never read it at all. So what's happening here? Why does our brain seem to let so much slip away? The answer isn't that we have bad memory. The problem is that we've misunderstood what memory actually is and how it works. Most people treat their brain like a recording device, like a camera that's supposed to capture everything it sees. But that's not how it functions, not even close. Think about the last time you walked through your house. You saw the furniture, the walls, the doors. But right now, could you describe the exact pattern of wear on your doorknob or the precise number of books on your shelf? You saw these things, but you didn't encode them. Your brain didn't store them because it didn't think they mattered. This is the first thing to understand. Your brain is not trying to remember everything. It's trying to remember what's important, and it decides what's important based on very specific signals. If we want to remember what we read, we need to understand these signals and work with them, not against them. Let's start with what actually happens when you read something. The words come in through your eyes. They get processed in the visual cortex. Then they're converted into meaning in the language centers of your brain. But here's the critical part. Just because information reaches your brain doesn't mean it gets stored there. It's like the difference between someone telling you something and you actually writing it down. The information was present, but was it recorded? Memory formation requires something more than just exposure. It requires encoding, and encoding doesn't happen automatically. It happens when your brain decides that the information is worth the energy it takes to store it. Because make no mistake, remembering things costs energy. Maintaining neural connections, strengthening synapses, integrating new information with old information, all of this requires resources. So your brain is selective. Think of it this way. Imagine you're walking through fresh snow. The first time you take a path, you leave footprints, but they're shallow. If it snows again, those footprints disappear. But if you walk the same path every day, eventually you create a clear trail. The snow gets packed down, the path becomes obvious. That's what happens with memory. A single exposure creates a faint trace, but repetition, and more importantly, engagement with the material, packs that path down. But here's where it gets interesting. Not all repetition is equal. You could read the same page 10 times passively, letting your eyes glide over the words, and still remember almost nothing. Why? Because your brain isn't interpreting passive reading as a signal that this information matters. There's no struggle, no effort, no connection being made. It's like walking the same path in the snow, but stepping in slightly different places each time. You never reinforce the same trail. So what does work? What makes information stick? The answer lies in something called elaborative encoding. This is the process of connecting new information to things you already know, of transforming abstract concepts into concrete examples, of asking questions about what you're reading rather than just absorbing it. Let's say you're reading about how the heart pumps blood. If you just read the heart has four chambers and valves that prevent backflow, that's one kind of learning. It's abstract, it's isolated. But if you stop and think, wait, why four chambers? Why not two or six? And these valves, they're like the check valves in plumbing that keep water from flowing backward. Now you're doing something different. You're connecting the new information to something you already understand. You're asking why things are the way they are. You're building mental models. This is what makes information memorable. Not repetition alone, but meaningful processing. Your brain stores things that it has worked with, manipulated, questioned, and connected. It's the difference between hearing a phone number once and dialing a phone number. When you dial it, you have to actively recall each digit, place it in sequence, and execute an action. That active retrieval is what creates strong memory traces. There's a principle in neuroscience called the generation effect. It shows that information we generate ourselves is remembered better than information we simply read. If you read a sentence like, the hungry man ate the pizza, you'll remember it somewhat. But if you read, the hungry man ate the, and have to supply the word yourself, you'll remember it much better. Why? Because generation requires retrieval. It requires you to search your memory, to activate related concepts, to create something rather than just receive it. This is why summarizing what you read in your own words is so powerful. When you close the book and try to explain the concept to yourself, you're forcing your brain to reconstruct the information from memory. And that reconstruction process, that's what creates strong, lasting memories. Every time you successfully retrieve something, you're strengthening the path to it. Now, there's another crucial element, understanding. True understanding creates memory almost automatically. Think about the difference between memorizing a series of random numbers and understanding why those numbers form a pattern. 
Random numbers are hard to remember because there's no structure, no meaning. But if you understand that the numbers are the Fibonacci sequence, where each number is the sum of the two before it, suddenly they're easy. You don't need to memorize each individual number because you understand the rule that generates them. This is why reading for understanding, not just for exposure, is so important. When you understand something deeply, when you grasp not just what happens, but why it happens, you're creating a compressed representation in your mind. Instead of storing a thousand individual facts, you're storing the underlying principle that generates those facts. It's vastly more efficient. Consider how you remember stories versus how you remember lists. Stories are easy to remember because they have structure, cause and effect, character motivation, sequences that make sense. Lists are hard because they're arbitrary. There's no inherent connection between item one and item two. This tells us something important. Our memory is designed for meaning, not for arbitrary information. So when you're reading, especially something dense or technical, the key is to constantly search for the meaning. Don't just read what happens, ask why it happened. Don't just accept a statement, think about what it implies. Does this new piece of information contradict something you thought before? Does it explain something you've been confused about? Does it connect to something in a completely different domain? These questions aren't extra work on top of reading. They are the work. They're what transforms reading from a passive activity into an active one. And active processing is what creates memory. There's also the matter of timing. Our brains consolidate memories in phases. When you first read something, it exists in what we call working memory. This is temporary, like RAM in a computer. It holds information just long enough for you to use it. But for information to move into long-term storage, it needs to be consolidated and consolidation takes time. This is why cramming doesn't work well. You can shove information into working memory right before a test, and it might be there when you need it, but a week later, it's gone. It never got properly consolidated. The information never made it from that temporary storage into the stable long-term networks of your brain. What does work is spaced repetition. Instead of reading something once for an hour, you're better off reading it for 20 minutes, then coming back to it tomorrow, then again in three days, then again in a week. Each time you return to the material, you're forcing your brain to retrieve it. And retrieval is what strengthens memory. The spacing gives your brain time to consolidate between sessions. But here's what makes this even more effective. Each time you come back, don't just reread. Test yourself. Try to recall the main points before you look at them again. This retrieval practice is one of the most powerful learning techniques we know of. It feels harder than just rereading. It's supposed to. That difficulty is the signal your brain needs to recognize that this information is important. Think about learning to ride a bicycle. You can watch videos of people riding bikes. You can read about balance and momentum, but you won't learn until you actually get on the bike and struggle with it. The struggle, the wobbling, the near falls, these aren't obstacles to learning, they are learning. Your brain learns by doing, by failing, by correcting. The same is true for intellectual learning. The struggle to recall, the effort to reconstruct, the work of generating answers, this is what creates lasting memory. Now, let's talk about something subtle but important. Context and cues. Memories aren't stored in isolation. They're stored in networks connected to all sorts of contextual information. Where were you when you learned something? What were you thinking about? What else was happening? All of these become cues that can trigger the memory later. This is why it's easier to remember something in the same environment where you learned it. The room, the lighting, even the smell, these all become associated with the memory. But here's the problem. If you only study in one place, your memory becomes dependent on those cues. And when you need to recall the information somewhere else, it's harder. The solution is to vary your learning environment. Read in different places. Review material in different contexts. This forces your brain to encode the information more abstractly, less tied to specific cues. It makes the memory more flexible, more robust, more accessible from different mental states. There's also the question of depth. You can read something at a surface level, understanding the basic gist, or you can read it deeply, wrestling with implications and connections. Deep processing creates stronger memories. It's the difference between recognizing a face and knowing a person. Recognition is shallow, you know you've seen them before. Knowing is deep, you understand their personality, their history, their quirks. When you read, aim for knowing, not just recognizing. This means pausing frequently. It means asking questions. What's the author really saying here? Why is this point important? How does this relate to what came before? Could this be explained differently? Do you agree with this? Why or why not? These questions might slow down your reading speed, but they dramatically increase what you retain. And here's something interesting. Over time, as you get better at this kind of active reading, it doesn't slow you down as much. You develop the skill of reading and thinking simultaneously. The questioning becomes automatic. You start to notice patterns more quickly. 
make connections more easily. Your understanding accelerate. Let's consider one more aspect, the role of emotion. We remember things better when they're emotionally significant. A dramatic story sticks more than a dry recitation of facts. Why? Because emotion is one of the brain signals that something matters. When you feel something, curiosity, surprise, confusion, excitement, your brain pays more attention. It encodes more deeply. This doesn't mean you need to artificially manufacture emotion while reading. But it does mean that staying engaged, staying curious, allowing yourself to be surprised or puzzled, these states facilitate memory. If you're bored, if you're just going through the motions, your brain interprets that as a signal that this information isn't important. It allocates fewer resources to encoding it. So if you find yourself bored while reading something you need to remember, that's a problem to solve, not just a mood to tolerate. Can you approach the material differently? Can you find a question within it that genuinely interests you? Can you look for connections to something you do care about? Sometimes the key to remembering isn't technique, it's finding a way to genuinely engage with the material. All of this points to a central truth about memory. It's not a passive recording. It's an active reconstruction. Every time you remember something, you're rebuilding it from pieces. And the act of rebuilding it changes it slightly, strengthens certain connections, weakens others. Your memory is alive, dynamic, constantly being reshaped by how you use it. This means that the best way to remember what you read is to use it, write about it, explain it to someone else, apply it to a problem you're trying to solve. Think about how it changes what you believed before. Let it interact with other things, you know. Every time you actively work with the information, you're strengthening it, integrating it more deeply into your web of knowledge. The person who reads a book and then closes it, moving on to the next thing, will forget most of it. The person who reads a book and then spends time thinking about it, discussing it, applying its ideas, will remember it for years. The difference isn't in the reading itself, it's in what happens after. Here's the beautiful part. Once you understand how memory works, you stop fighting against your brain, you work with it. You recognize that forgetting is natural and expected when you don't give your brain the signals it needs. You understand that difficulty during learning isn't a sign you're doing something wrong, it's often a sign you're doing something right. That struggle to recall, that effort to connect ideas, that work of generating rather than just receiving, this is what builds lasting knowledge. Memory isn't about having a better brain. It's about using your brain the way it's designed to be used. And it's designed for meaning, for connection, for active engagement. Give it those things and you'll be amazed at what stays with you. Not because you have a special gift, but because you're working with the natural mechanisms of how learning happens. The next time you pick up something to read, something you want to remember, don't just read it. Engage with it. Question it. Connect it. Reconstruct it in your own words. Come back to it. Test yourself on it. Let it change how you think about other things. Treat reading not as a task to complete, but as a conversation to have with ideas. Do this, and you won't need tricks or mnemonics for most of what you read. Understanding itself will be your memory. The ideas will stick not because you forced them to, but because they became part of how you think. And that's not just better memory, that's actual learning.